introduces, my name's Arun. I'm a software engineer at Datadog. I've worked at Datadog for four years now. I'm currently in the cross-product queries team where I work on materialized views and uh, derived data sets. Uh, before this team, I used to work in our high-performance transaction systems team for three years where I, uh, where I was focused on queue schedulers and execution runtimes. So first, before we discuss views and materialized views, I'm gonna explain why uh, it's important Cool, thanks. Uh, so yeah, before uh, before we discuss what, uh, views and materialized views, I'm gonna explain why query performance is important for us. So for an application like Datadog that's inherently interactive, query performance often plays a pivotal role in user experience. So if a user were to experience a slow UI or if our query responses were slow, it can lead to frustration, pr re reduce productivity, and ultimately it makes the product less valuable to the user. And eventually they might switch over to a different competitor. Also, fast and reliable queries allow us to build simpler systems that are more efficient and that can scale better. So efficient queries allow us to reduce the load on our storage servers and ultimately help us save costs. Also, in a crowded market, performance can be a significant differentiator. Uh, having fast, fast query performance means that our applications can be more engaging, they increase uh, user engagement. And so yeah, so query performance plays a pivotal role in staying ahead of the competition. So ultimately, query performance isn't just about speed, it's about building applications that deliver value, enhance user engagement, and uh, scale. So in order to meet these needs, Datadog has developed a number of storage systems over the years. Each one is optimized for different use cases. So first, we have Husky, which is our event store. It's optimized for, as the name suggests, uh, storing and retrieving event-based data. So this powers key products like metrics, uh, sorry, tra uh, logs and traces. Then we have our metrics database, which uh, stores time series. It's our time series database. It stores metrics data points. It's optimized for you know, like more real-time use cases. And then we've got reference tables, which allows users to import data into Datadog and combine that with other information that exists in Datadog. Uh, then we have other specialized databases for tracking infrastructure, for relationships between infrastructure resources, as well as traditional databases like uh, Cassandra and Postgres. So each of these were developed at different points that, uh, that are optimized for different use cases, but in order to build advanced products, we often have to combine data from many of these systems. Um, and so in order to meet this, so one example of product that uh, that combines data from multiple sources is our cloud cost uh, management product. So this product essentially queries data from our resources database and combines it with information in our metrics database to identify resources that are underutilized. It then provides uh, insights into potential cost savings to the customer. So over here we have a, an RDS database uh, that has no connections to it and this is only possible because we can query the resources database and the metrics database. Um, so yeah, and yeah, cr uh, sorry, cloud cost product is one example, but there are many products at Datadog that all share this fundamental need for cross uh, storage access. And for this, we developed a query engine in-house that is capable of querying data from these multiple sources and combining them. It exposes a SQL interface that you can perform joins with. It has subqueries, common table expressions, uh, you know, like pretty standard SQL stuff. Uh, Yes, it is possible to query each of these databases manually and do all the aggregations in the application, but that's often cumbersome to do because each of these databases has its own query, uh, syntax, and semantics, and presents a steep learning curve compared to standard SQL. And so as we developed more product using these new capabilities, we started encountering new challenges. The first is latency. So as we are combining data from many of these systems and we're querying large volumes of data, it, started, like, it, it can easily become very, a very slow query to run. And that in turn makes our applications slower. The next is efficiency. So Datadog products often allow users to uh, perf uh, perform drill downs and filters on the data that we present to them. So a user might be able to filter data just to a particular data center and then they might be able to filter it further down to only a service. Um, so what ends up happening is we have to query our uh, storage systems over and over again for all of these uh, drill downs and filters that they do. 
And then as we build more complex applications, our SQL queries started getting really complex. Some of them were over 500 lines long, which makes it really hard to manage, understand, and maintain. So one of the initial solutions we considered was a cache. We can use something like Redis that sits between our, day, our, app, our query engine and our users and serves requests from cache. So in that case, you know, our latency can be fast. However, it falls short in the other areas we discussed. Like if we were to perform drill downs or aggregation or like filters on this data, it doesn't help because caches can help when the, when the queries are exactly identical, but not when we are using filters and drill downs. Uh, the other issue is that it doesn't help with optimizing query or like optimizing our or simplifying our complex SQL queries. So for that, we decided to build a solution into our query layer itself using views and materialized views. So to start off with, I'm going to describe what a view is. A view is essentially a short name for a long query. So in this example, we have a view called cloud cost that is performing a query on our cost table. Uh, and once a view is created, it can be used like any other SQL table. So what happens is when a query referencing a view enters our query engine, it translates that into a detailed SQL query that ends up querying the underlying table. So with this, what we can do is take a large SQL query, break it down into smaller views that are you know, descript with descriptive names and that are easier to understand. Then we have materialized views, uh, which are similar to views in that they are also a short name for a long query, but they have a storage component to it. In this case, the query referenced by the materialized view, we store the results separately from the underlying data. And the idea is that we can store it in a way that's more efficient and optimized uh, for the query that we're making. And then we also need to have a separate mechanism that synchronizes the materialized view with the underlying data set. At Datadog, we use scheduled refreshes. So we have a process that runs every so often. It'll read the data from the underlying storage and then rewrite the data in our materialized view. And yeah, in this case, when the query system encounters a query containing a materialized view, it will query this alternate storage rather than querying the underlying database. So with this, we can optimize our, anytime we have a large SQL query that's querying a lot of data and performing a lot of complex aggregations, we can pre-compute all of that and it helps address the latency issues uh, versus running it directly against the underlying storage. So at Datadog, our query engine is exposes a gRPC API for creating views and materialized views. Uh, it essentially takes in a view definition and a refresh schedule. The view definition has an org ID. An org ID identifies a Datadog customer, essentially, and it's basically the data over which we create the view upon. And view schema is sort of a namespace, and then we have the view name and the view query. Um, this is all stored in a database. We just use Postgres to store, store both of these information. And then if you noticed in my earlier slide, uh, frequency, uh, like the view schedule has a frequency as well as a max frequency. The reason for this is that our query system automatically tracks how often views are being used and will adjust the, the refresh rate within this range. So if a view is queried very often, in this example, it'll be refreshed every five minutes. And if the view is queried less often, it'll slowly back off to all the way to one hour. And then after a days of inactivity, uh, it'll completely stop refreshing the view. We also have this runtime threshold parameter. This essentially says that if a view runs in less than this amount of time, do not bother materializing it, just run the query directly. And the reason for this is that it's not uncommon for Datadog products to depend on multiple materialized views. And we've got multiple products and thousands and thousands of orgs. So you can imagine the scale of this, right? Uh, and if we were, and it would be incredibly wasteful for us to maintain these views for orgs that don't use certain features. So the idea is like if we track what's being used, we can only refresh those and nothing, nothing else. And the runtime threshold exists because we have a lot of small orgs that don't have all that much data to begin with. And we don't even, and oftentimes it's more expensive to maintain views for them. It, it's much cheaper to just run the query directly. So we, another component of our system is the hit tracker. Hits are tracked through API calls as well. The hit tracker in real time will update the frequencies in our database based on, um, based on usage. Then the next component in our system are the workers. The workers are essentially horizontally scalable nodes that execute queries that back views against our query engine. 
And in our case, instead of, ha instead of having the query engine return results to the workers, we just have it uh, write uh, results directly to object storage. So it's like just a minor uh, optimization there. And the last component in our system are, is the scheduler. The scheduler, for the scheduler, we use Zookeeper to elect one of our nodes as the leader. The leader then queries views from our database and identifies views that are due for refresh based on the frequency and the last time the view was uh, queried for. And then it triggers, sends, that, sends that request off to the worker. So putting it all together, this is what our system looks like. Uh, the API server on the left tracks hits and is responsible for CRUD requests of views. Then the scheduler identifies when uh, views are due for refresh and then the worker that executes the queries themselves. So yeah, with this, we are able to solve a lot of problems, but like any engineering solution, it comes with its trade-offs. The first is that the freshness of views there's an inherent limitation on how fresh the views can be because we're doing scheduled refreshes. Let's say if we're refreshing every five minutes, then we may present data to the user that's as old as five minutes. That's fine for a lot of our use cases, but for more for applications that are more real time, that are time sensitive, it's, it's not a good solution. Uh, the other is cost. Although we do a lot through hit tracking and scheduling to minimize the number of views we have to refresh, Every time we do have to, we refresh a view, we have to query the entire data set again and then write all of that out to storage, um, even if nothing has really changed for that data set. So in order to now, like, work around these um, trade-offs, we're looking at incremental view materialization techniques. This is where we capture change streams from our database and we can only update views that, uh, that are affected by the changes. Um, and since most of our data is event-based or time-based, we think this is like a, we think this would be a good solution for us. So yeah, that's if these are the kinds of problems that interest you. We are hiring. Um, check out our job postings and apply. Apply to them if you're interested. And that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Uh, we're thinking of using something like that. So like, uh, sorry, the question is, is there are techniques to automatically convert a SQL query into a streaming query. Are we going to use that? Uh, so one of the technologies in that space is Feldera. That's something we are very interested in. And yeah, that's one of the things we plan to explore. On. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is a challenge question, but no? uh, earlier you mentioned that for much smaller customers, it's cheaper to just run the query that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, why is it cheaper to run the query directly versus using a materialized view for smaller customers? I mean, the answer is they often have very little data to begin with. And so we don't really have to query all of that much data, right? Like if you're doing a materialized view, we have to query the data, we have to store that in object storage, which all takes time. You know, let's say that process takes like 500, 600 milliseconds. If we can query the data directly in 300 or 200 milliseconds, then we don't have to pay that additional overhead. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, how do we track the runtime of queries? Um, for that, we don't, it's, not, it's, not, it's not detected ahead of time. When our scheduler runs and like, attempts to refresh the query, that's when we measure how long it takes. And then if it takes within a certain, less than a certain threshold, we don't store the result. Uh, with the materialized view, or? Yeah, with the maintain, like what part of the system is, or is there like a part? I mean, is the slowest thing that so uh, the thing is, uh, like a lot of the bottlenecks have to do with like the queries that we run itself. In this case, you know, we, like the frequency set to five minutes, but oftentimes we may not be able to run the query in five minutes. Like our, 
you know, it may take much longer. So that's like one of the bottlenecks in our system currently. Yeah, the question is, uh, did we use any, or did we experiment with any other technologies other, th other than Zookeeper? Um, so firstly, we use Zookeeper only for leader election. So just choose a pod as leader, and then we read the data from our Postgres database. So for that, we did not really explore. We just needed a, a leader-based system, and Zookeeper is pretty uh, standard thing to use for that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, so the question is, why did we choose object storage versus um, like another kind of storage medium? Yeah, a lot of our story, like a lot of our data tends to be like columnar and analytical. So like query performance is not very, uh, it's, not, it's not that sensitive to it. So like the, we can tolerate the latencies that object storage provides. And a lot of our query engines also like natively work with things like Parquet. So it's just very easy to output, output directly. I mean, it's cost minimization, but it's also like throughput, right? Like, if we were to refresh every view we had, it would be like, you know, thousands and thousands of queries. But this, we only refresh views that are used, which is like a very small percentage in the end. Yep. Uh, so in this, yeah. So for I think we're. We are providing better performance by trading off data freshness. Data freshness. Yep. And where we are saving money is, let's say, you know, a customer doesn't use the cloud cost management product, right? They've never been to that web page. In that case, we don't run any materialization for that customer. And the first time they run, yes, that might be slow. But every subsequent time after that, we won't, uh, they won't experience that slowness. Cool, all right, thanks, thanks.